Well, welcome to this um, management committee meeting of the Russell Coates Art Gallery and Museum. And I alert uh, members that this is both recorded and is being transmitted as we speak, so it can be accessed by the public. Um, let me turn to uh, the um, agenda, which, as is customary, to receive apologies uh, for absence. Um, Nikki, do you wish to record those or do you want me to read them in? Uh, that's fine, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we've received apologies from Councillor Williams and from Mr Frost. Good, and we do wish uh, Councillor Williams the very best, as I understand he is um, uh, undergoing a procedure today, so um, my, our very best wishes to him. Um, the second item, again, is customary, uh, whether there are any declarations of interest. None have been declared. Um, I then uh, turn uh, back to you, Nikki, to ask whether you have received any um, public issues uh, or have been notified of matters that should be raised which aren't otherwise on our agenda. Thank you, Chairman. No, nothing has been received for public issues. If that being the case, we can move to item five, which is the Russell Coates Art Gallery and Museum update report. And it covers the period um, from this April back to just before. Oh, no, let, I have jumped ahead. Um, we have to confirm the minutes of two meetings, one which took place on Friday, the 22nd of October, the second on Wednesday the 12th of January. Um, let me first ask whether uh, they are um, a correct record of the meetings which took place on those dates. So for accuracy, the 22nd of October. Agreed for their accuracy. And then those which took place on the 12th of January which was when we considered the, um, the financial reports. We're happy with that. And are we therefore agreed that they are a true record of our deliberations on those two occasions? Agreed. Thank you very much. And that does allow us to move to the report I've already referred to. And I invite um, you, Sarah, to... Um, draw out from the report matters of um, particularity and any that may require resolution by the management committee. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I just I suppose uh, it feels like a good report to um, to report to, to to have delivered to be able to deliver because it sort of represents a kind of return to some sort of normality over the last six months. I think it's a really positive um, response to um, so it's been a very difficult time um, and the museum I think has responded really well to that so I think we'll credit to the, to the team um, so during that period you'll see that kind of visitor numbers were back up to 92% level of pre-COVID levels which is pretty amazing um, and um, really interesting to, to, to know your perspectives on what's coming forward I think it's been, been particularly lucky um, things may, um, I think, things the situation may, may change slightly uh, in the next year as um, um, as uh, people can travel and so on and so forth. But anyway, it has been a good year. We've uh, well, a good six months that I'm reporting on. Um, so just to briefly pull out some uh, highlights, obviously, uh, number visitor numbers very good despite Omicron, BA two, which obviously had an impact on people's confidence. Uh, people have come back um, in significant uh, numbers. Um, we saw. Seen the benefits of the Arts Council Cultural Recovery Fund. We also see the benefits of the reduction in um, VAT levels. So we were down to, well, they went from 5% back up to 12%, which during this period, so that's allowed income to be significantly higher than it would have run normally. So, so that has been um, extremely positive. Um, a lot of work on the building. Obviously, as we'll report later, the mentor fund has come through, but we've also done uh, the major installation of the new fire panel. So the museum was closed for three weeks in January, 
um, and the new fire panel was installed on time and to, to um, well, it had been delayed. It was meant to be in October, but anyway, it was finally installed and that has really significantly updated and modernised our fire system reporting. So that's really um, um, encouraging. Um, the, a little bit of work has been done on a fire audit by external specialists uh, looking at the fire comp compartmentalisation. There was some concern by our surveyor uh, about the compartmentalisation. I think they're happy with that, but there are still work that to be done um, around the, the whole the sort of Swiss cheese effect um, that, um, that has been created a little bit with the um, services that the facilities that have been drilled through. And so uh, we're waiting for a final report on that and there may be some actions that need to be taken just to reduce risk there. Um, we've used this period of closure to, I think, invest significantly in some of the conservation and improvements to the visitor experience. So if anyone's been recently, we've really uh, displayed galleries one and two um, so that some of the some of our sort of icon most iconic works have moved into the light, as it were. Um, we've done a major bit of conservation on submission of Emperor Barbarossa, which has completely transformed it and shows what a bit of um, some funding uh, and some investment into the conservation will do. So that's so I think those two those two galleries are significantly um, improved, and we've also um, conducted some more conservation some of the um, um, furniture. And the other additional thing really is the carpet. So we had an on we've got an ongoing problem with the um, dining room floor, which obviously was not designed for 50,000 sets of feet to go through it and has been showing increasing signs of wear. So we have um, um, installed a sort of sac a carpet sacrificially to be worn out to protect the floor, but also it uh, really adds to the authentic ex um, experience there. So uh, that's been a really, really positive. Um, programming has come back on board. So the Bournemouth Arts Club opens and closed within this period and was really successful, really positive, uh, really lovely exhibition um, curated by an external curator, Jill Clark, and, um, you know, ticked so many boxes, some wonderful work, really interesting, and it talked, it was looking really at the 100 years of the visual arts scene in Bournemouth, so uh, it was very res um, resonated as well today, so that's been very positive. Um, and we've currently got the Lost Words exhibition, which is a bit of a cultural phenomenon, um, featuring the work of um, Robin Carlin and Jackie Morris, and I think that's uh, been popular with families and with people particularly interested in, in um, natural history. And there'll be some programming around that coming up. Um, there was a it is the centenary year, and the actual day itself, the 10th of March, was a bit of a special day when we had to, the mayor came in, didn't he? And uh, we had a sort of party for volunteers and uh, staff who'd been working at the museum. We had somebody who visited, who came to that, who had started working at the Russell Coast 40 years ago. Um, so that was quite a special, special evening. Um, lovely to, to share that kind of, you know, an amazing um, contribution to Bournemouth um, by the Russell Coast to share that with those people who've been kind of involved in that. Um, particularly successful, we are doing the sixpence days where we're opening the museum on, I think it's four Thursdays, uh, during the year for sixpence, which is the charge, which was the charge in 1922. Uh, I think we had four, say there, 434 visitors in a day. So that was, um, it was, it was lovely. And it was, what was so interesting was that there were many people obviously who'd spotted this as a bargain and come, but there were also a lot of people who, for whom the Russell Coates is such a special place that they'd wanted to come back on that specific day to be there to sort of have that to be there for that moment. So that's, um, uh, that's, that's, that's the centenary year started well, and we've got various other Kind of activities and events and performances and so on um, through the um, schedule through the year. Um, we continue to do um, events, activities, trying to reach wider audiences, our lengths program, um, we've done tactile tours for visually impaired, we've done conservation days, we've, we've had school visits and we've even gone ahead with our AUV installation again, which I think is the fifth, fourth, fifth year. Um, so it's been disturbed by, by um, COVID that's come back on board. So um, I think that's all moving uh, in the right direction. Um, the cafe has done well with the opening of the terrace. There's real still opportunities there to develop that offer. Um, but we've now opened up the terrace and it's got a little cart so people can have teas, coffees and afternoon teas with one of the best, has to be one of the best views in Bournemouth. Um, and that has gone really well, obviously totally weather dependent, but um, it's, been, it's been good and there's more opportunity there. The, the shop has done well, again, interestingly, um, 
has come back a different, a different clientele. So obviously we're missing overseas visitors and it's more staycations and British visitors and their shopping habits are slightly different. So there's been a sort of slight, slight change in focus of the, uh, of the stock of the shop. Um, but um, we're trying to kind of keep up, up with that. And it's obviously quite difficult to be responsive and obviously the risk of, of buying stock um, that isn't then going to be um, bought. Um, so it's trying to kind of get that balance right. Um, one really interesting development, if anyone's been in recently, we've developed a pop-up shop with an external um, consultant in the cafe, particularly focused on lost words, which has got lots of merchandise and opportunities. And that ha is going exceptionally well. So it'll be really interesting to see at the end of this exhibition period just how well that, um, that has done. Um, just one thing to say, just obviously like everybody's staffing is a bit of an issue, so we've got still got several um, posts that are uh, we're trying to recruit to, and obviously that is having an impact on the staffing. It's, it's a lot of work to do, and obviously with two staff down, um, it's um, quite challenging. So, um, but anyway, we've got some some some, some things hopefully um, coming through soon. So hopefully that won't be the situation for too long. Um, MEND fund I will talk about separately, and the National Portfolio Organisation. We're pulling that application together. As um, members will know, I've sent um, some information out. We'll pull that together uh, at a meeting separately um, to ensure that you're happy with the, um, uh, the kind of direction and the application there. That's a sort of quick summary. Thank you very much, Sarah. Now, are there any questions that people like to address? Uh, Councillor Dunlop. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Excuse me, I have to have these on. A bit of a hearing problem. <laughs> Um, uh, the first thing I'd like to say is this is a really, really great report. I did say this to you um, a while ago. It's really nice. It's really clear. It goes through everything that's been done in, in, in nice, simple language, which, which I really like. Um, I, I have to uh, commend you, actually, and the team on what you've managed to achieve and almost sort of bob and weave around COVID and around the difficulties um, and how you've taken advantage of those times when you were closed. So I, um, I really do take my hat off to your team for achieving that. Um, just a couple of things I just wanted to hone in on, if I can. Um, actually, first of all, can I have an explanation what you mean by sacrificial in terms of the... I, I'm not going to pretend to know all these terms um, uh, and, and how you mean it. That's quite interesting. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to ask was, you mentioned the suppliers and how some suppliers want to obviously be paid up front. I wondered, does that ha has that had, or is it like to have an impact on perhaps the kind of supplier you would like and the, 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 the quality of supplier? And then just one more thing, just I'd like to say a little bit more about the consultant. I find that quite fascinating that there are consultants that will come in and look at the museum shop, and I'm assuming he's a specialist. So just those three things, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, that's Donald. Yes, sacrificial means that um, <laughs> uh, that's basically we, we're using it and we're allowing it to be used to destruction. So, um, yes, so we've bought a 1920s um, Persian carpet, which is of the type that would have been used by Merton and Annie. Um, and it's not a collection item. It's just an item that we have bought and that we are expecting it to be used until it's, um, it's thrown away. Um, because what's happening at the moment, the room, the, it's an interesting one, the dining room, and obviously it's, not, it's one of these topics, but if you're a museum person, you could talk about this for literally an hour. Um, um, it's a, the room was never designed, the, the room was designed with um, wooden floorboards, um, but it wasn't but with a, a rug, as it would have been in those days, it wouldn't have been fitted carpet. Um, and obviously the floorboards are being worn out by the sheer numbers of people. Um, so we have to do something to protect the floor. So you've got various options that you could do. For example, you could do wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, but that wouldn't be appropriate. You people, sometimes the National Trust do a sort of like a vinyl covering, but that's not authentic. So in this case, we've bought an authentic carpet and we are using it. It should last 20 years. So it's not going to be worn out within a day or two, but we will use it um, to destruction. Um, and it was, because it's not a collections item, it, we can do that, we're allowed to do that. If it was a collections item, if it was the original carpet, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that. And interestingly on this one, we've, I've, I've um, made contact with the former Queen, what do you call, Surveyor of the Queen's 
art, Queen's painting, something like that. And he came to the museum the other day and spent four hours. I took him round, and he's been really useful as a contact. And I was obviously humming hard about what to do with this, and I sort of talked to him about what to do. And he said, a Buckingham Palace, which is obviously a working historic house in the way that the Russell Coates is a working historic house. This is kind of what they would do. So it's been really useful to get that kind of perspective. Um, so that's, that's what I mean by sacrificial. <laughs> Just name. What it, yeah, it on the on the yeah. Um, in terms of suppliers, um, yes, I think um, I think the shop manager would say that um, it is a bit of a problem, and I think it's a problem partly because of the way that the council systems of procurement work. So under under Oracle, you hopefully aren't familiar with this, but under Oracle, um, you have to order things up front. And it's not very happy about pay, being paid up front, so it is a challenge to find. Uh, suppliers who are prepared to work like this. So I think it has been a struggle. And obviously lots of suppliers have come and gone because of COVID. So I think there's been quite a bit of a churn and mix and uh, uh, trying to find new suppliers and, and so on. So I think that has been a bit of an issue, but we're, I think we're coming through the other side of that. We've got the mechanism now. And yes, the cons consultants, um, so there are specific um, museum merchandise, museum shop consultants that you can bring in who obviously it's a very, very particular market, it's a very particular um, uh, merchandise and so on. And, you, and uh, with this uh, particular um, consultant, Alison, uh, has come recommended and she's worked in similar sort of environments. And I think every now and again, something like shop, just well, everything in life, isn't it? it, needs a refresh. So our shop manager has done an amazing job. Our shop turns over 100,000 a year. I mean, it's pretty impressive for a shop, um, a museum shop, at, you know, this type, um, but everything needs to be refreshed. So she's brought some new ideas in. And um, so we have both an action plan for the conventional shop, the downstairs shop, and we've also produced this pop-up shop just to see how, whether we can drive, um, yeah, drive um, income. <laughs> Councillor Ian Jarl, have you any questions? Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, Sarah, Sarah, thank you. And, and congrats, congrats to yourself, to the staff the team there um, for kind of what's the word kind of resilience and excellence over what's been a very very difficult period and I don't care who said so, sort of that COVID is now behind us it's most certainly not behind us it continues in um, in its own way and still people today are feeling the effects of it and still we have absences and difficulties to work around so congrats on all of that in fact if I may start with that you, you've talked here about the staffing and a couple of you know for instance vacancies still unfilled and so on just, just as a general question, how, how is the team there? Because um, I think probably something here that um, maybe it's not something one goes into writing about, but literally kind of the mood, the feel and so on. And how how every, how's everybody coped over over this period, over the sort of latter end of last year and into this year? Um, I, I think we've coped, I think people have coped really, really well, actually. And I think it's been a really hard time. Uh, and I think we've had a very clear sense of direction and we have been very, very clear in the sense that the team take the responsibility of looking after the museum incredibly seriously. So I think we probably reported before about the issues around um, covering for security and so on. So we've been quite robust in ensuring that the museum is, uh, you know, staff come in and we obviously work, we work incredibly safely. Um, but I think in many ways it's been really good. So we've you know, my staff think we had a meeting yesterday and 90% of the staff were in the museum. So we've been coming in all the way through pretty well, well we have. And I think in some respects, that's allowed the team to support each other. And it's been really, really helpful because obviously people do need to be on site and so on. Obviously, there is a huge range of approaches and, and, and obviously not approaches, even, but I mean, of, of, um, of sensitivities around COVID because of people's personal circumstances that their family. And I think we've had one or two issues where it's sort of bubbled up, but actually in two years we've kept as a, a really good team as, uh, you know, as friends and, and supporters. So I think we're in a really strong place. I think people, I think people are really impressed. I mean, we really have, because of, I mean, I, I take my hat off to the Arts Council and to the BCP Council, financial support has given us a little bit of leeway to make things happen, to do things. So bizarrely, we've managed to use this in a really positive way because we know, knew where we were going. We had a very clear agenda. So a little bit of opportunity, I think everyone's completely on board. I have to say, everyone is exhausted. <laughs> and we're looking at NPO, aren't we, and what we might do next. And there is, I, the team did say to me the other day, could, could we just take six months off and just stop? Because just stop? there is a sense you can't do that, but it is, you know, it, it, we are pushing people to 
you know, to an extreme. And it, it's demonstrated in these figures and, and in this report that it, uh, you, know, I, you know, I do take, it is quite tough, I think, for everybody. No, no, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, sort of the backdrop to this is I think if there's, if there's something within what you're saying about there's a, firstly the resilience, but also that actually we've managed to basically hang on to people and not, you know, not sort of against their will or anything like that, but actually we've kept the core of the know-how, this, this kind of institution, this kind of activity more than any other, the sort of the know-how of the people involved is something almost one can't put the price on really, if, if those people were to, were to leave and it's to the credit of you and to everybody that if we are keeping that camaraderie and that skill and that know-how within the Russell Coast, because that's as almost as important as the collections itself and so on. Um, that's that's wonderful. Just I know from other experience in wider tourism and hospitality that many places are suffering from big turnover, but also a hell of a lot of loss of know-how from people who've uh, moved on for various reasons. So that's wonderful. Um, I think the only other thing I was going to comment on was um, Sorry, this may seem frivolous. There was just one wedding on this, and in a sense, you know, what's my question? Is, is, is there any ambition there? They can be lucrative, they can be a lot of hassle. What's your feeling? Well, interesting, there you are. That, that, that wedding that we had, we closed the museum, and that was because of, uh, a booking came through in the middle of COVID. And we thought, you know what, we don't know we're going to be open, we don't know what we're going to be, whether we're going to be closed. Let's take this wedding, and we did a lot of... We did some, so we did. So we had this. This was an old booking that we did in order to ensure that that income came through, and that is what the team has been doing. Incredibly, sort of, um, flexible and responsive to these sort of things. So that was uh, an odd thing that happened with the wed wedding. We've also had a lot of filming recently, which is interesting as well. Again, uh, really, uh, really trying to use take opportunities uh, from these things. Weddings, actually, I think we have decided as a team that we are not going to continue with weddings. I think we've got a license that will continue. And I suppose if someone came to us and said, um, let's have, you know, can we have a wedding? We would, talk, we would possibly talk about it. But like you say, there are huge amounts of work. And I think, I don't know what the, what the rule of thumb is, but for every, say, 10 inquiries, which you have to go through in considerable detail, maybe one will come out. And obviously the museum is a very challenging environment for weddings need. You know, there's no, there's no vehicle access, you can't have red wine, the spaces are very small, you know, it's quite dark, etc., etc. It's not a natural environment. So our feeling is actually that our energies are put into something more um, suitable where we can really win so rather than, than wedding. So that's where we are. When it comes to the point where the licence uh, comes to an end, I think then, that, then that's a decision, decision time at the moment, that's it. So I think it, it's, we're not advertising it, we're not promoting it particularly, and we'll just take it on the case in that case. <clears throat> Councillor, I, I presume you were talking about the ceremony rather than the fact of marriage. Oh, Although, like the ceremony, that's uh, right. Hassle yeah. yes. and expense um, are, are familiar. Well, it applies to the other one as well, familiar of course. Yeah, words. Yeah. Um, I'm looking, Sir George, um, is there anything you wish to ask, Sarah? Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Sarah, I uh, just wanted to know... Um, in terms of the shop merchandise, is what's our best-selling item? Do you know? In the script, and I took it out because I thought no one wants to know that level of detail. I think the guidebook <laughs> is the number one seller. Um, the um, interestingly, with the this current exhibition, I think at the moment the book that accompanies that exhibition, the Lost Words, is number two. And then from memory, it will be, um, it will be prints. So what the strength of the Russell Coates is, and it's most unusual for most museums, is the strength of its visual collection. So it's all those amazing, you know, it's the painting. So people come away and they want to have a print of, you know, Venus or spray or whatever it is. And that is, is, is where there's most significant um, things come on. But I think, you know, if you were looking at a single item in the collection, it would be um, guidebook. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm, is there anything you wish to ask, Sarah? Um, th thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, just uh, to add to what's just been said about weddings, um, uh, and I think uh, we know from our experience in other historic properties in BCP that they are a lot of work, but, but I think they work particularly well when you have um, a part of the building or 
a second building, as in the case of Poole, where, where you can put on weddings, uh, and in Russell Coates that isn't the case. So I think more than, more than just the, the difficulty of putting them on, I think it's uh, incredibly disruptive for, for the public and, uh, and, and, and the museum generally. Um, so I completely understand why Sarah um, has said what she's said. I'd just like to add to what um, Councillor Dunlop said that uh, I think it's um, a, a fantastic report and I think the, the visitor numbers um, looking across the sector are particularly strong. So I think that is a, a huge endorsement of the team and, uh, uh, and to Sarah for um, great work that's been done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all of you. Uh, Adding my own comments again, it's one of congratulation to you, Sarah, and to your colleagues. Um, I had the great privilege of attending the uh, centenary celebration of both the museum and gallery, but also of the Bournemouth Arts Club. And I thought that that event was particularly impressive, not through its scale, but the the celebration that it offered of 100 years of visual um, visual arts uh, in this these boroughs, really, although it is called Bournemouth, it spreads beyond that. And I think it's often overlooked of how strong the visual arts and the practice of visual arts are in this area. And it it may have been a hundred years, but it didn't dwell on the past, but very, very much look forward to the next hundred years, as indeed we did at the centenary of the uh, museum and gallery itself. A lot of history upon which we can, um, you know, we can gain much, but also a very big future that we look forward to. So once again, congratulations to you and your colleagues for being part of that very, very significant journey. If there are no other matters, we can move to item six. Now, this is a recommendation about the chair, um, and I have taken advice from Democratic Services. Um, as you know, I am not a voting member of the management committee, so I've been instructed that I can actually remain seated um, and to offer the item um, to others who may wish to speak to it. Um, Councillor Dunlop? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Chairman. It was just to say that I think perhaps we need to accept the recommendation in item five, so it's formally minuted that we accept the recommendation and agree the action suggested in the report. Um, I think I'm, I'm instructed that I require a, a show of the hands that are here today because, uh, as you know, yourself and Councillor Yengar are the only formal trustees and that are allowed to vote. Although I say this, Sir George, um, are, are you a voting member of the committee? No, no, sadly not. Um, in which case, can I uh, ask whether the recommendation as published in your papers, which um, I should read, that the Management Committee recommend to Cabinet that the Chair of the Management Committee be given a further term of office to provide vital continuity at an exceptional time for the Russell Coates, both externally and internally. Chair, I think was Councillor Don referring to item five, the one that we've just well, been discussing. Well, yes, I, I, and I have skipped that. that, but I was going to Sorry. go back to that one. Or are you? Are... Sorry. Sorry. Right. Which one were you referring to, Councillor Dunlop? Sorry, I was just suggesting that before we move on to item <laughs> right. six. Sorry, are we to, no. yeah, that we accept the recommendation of, course. of item of, five, of course. which Thank we you. haven't done. I'm sorry. Do you know, I'm not normally a stickler. I'm sure my colleagues, I'm not normally a stickler, but as we are. <laughs> this is a, I'm expediting business we need rather to, to uh, 
uh, can quickly. zoom back to item five right. and accept the rest. First of all, let us take the recommendation for the item we've discussed at length, notably that the management committee accept the Russell Coates Art Gallery Museum Review Report for the period from the 1st of October and agree the action suggested in that report. Carried unanimously. Thank you. Now I turn to the recommendation which um, I did introduce, but let me once again give the opportunity for comment, questions on or views. Other than I fully support it, I have nothing really to add to um, the report. It's very clear of why we need to do this. We need some consistency and we need to maintain where we are. We've got some challenges um, and I fully support the recommendation. That was really all. Thank you. Can, can I um, second what uh, Councillor Dunlop saying? I, I, in, within this, I congratulate sort of um, first of all the officer Sarah, yourself, Chair, also the help of Democratic Services as well, because um, sometimes I think in um, in council life these things are never quite straightforward. So what seems to be an eminently sensible decision still has a number of hurdles and loops and what have you to uh, jump through um, before this can be sort of confirmed formally. I'm glad it has been. I'm glad we're here. Very delighted to support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I invite the show of hands for the uh, recommendation, which is that uh, a recommendation to Cabinet is made by the committee such that the chair of the committee be given a further term of office to provide continuity at an exceptional time for the museum and gallery, both externally and internally. Carried unanimously. Thank you. And that, of course, is a recommendation to Cabinet where the decision will be made. So this is, as it says, a recommendation. Thank you very much. Excuse me, Chair. Uh, may I just ask on the back of that, and I'm sorry I should have pre -known. Do we know, um, so when when it's coming to Cabinet, in a sense, my question is really, is there a date when Cabinet must have decided this to ensure that continuity? Well, I, I, I am informed, though Sarah will contradict, which, given my past record this afternoon, is likely. Um, I believe the tenure would have expired in October, so there is a certain amount of time for this to take place. Chairman. So, yeah, Chairman, uh, can I just confirm, I did speak to Sarah Colwick earlier, um, who looks after Cabinet, as you know, uh, if Sarah Newman, if you can get the report done as soon as possible and liaise with Sarah, uh, you won't get to the May cabinet meeting, but hopefully you could get it onto the June one. But uh, if you can just liaise with Sarah Colwick, uh, get that on the forward plan, that should be okay for June. Councillor Eager. Actually, can I just uh, ask uh, to uh, Miss Hooley, the officer, just um we, we can try for the June cabinet. I'm aware of quite a considerable number of items on the cabinet forward plan. Do, can you help us with what is the latest cabinet? It's good to know what's the latest one that we can go for, which ensures the continuity, please. Should respect it would be the September meeting. Okay, the very latest is September, yes. but ideally yeah. before September. Yes, because it is uh, early October that the, the term would normally finish. Um, so obviously to help with with kind of planning as well for meetings of, of this committee, it'd be good to get it done sort of before that, but we could take it up to then. Good. Thank you very much. Um, let us move to um, item seven. It's an item we always enjoy because um, I remember a previous meeting where deliberations made over a wheelbarrow, um, but this time, Sarah, yeah, I don't know how Item seven, acquisitions, loans and disposals. The end of the night, I know, but actually I have missing the report which actually details what's... Um, did you have a list? Have you got the, the appendix? No. Oh dear. I don't know. It didn't... It, didn't, um, it does not appear with the, um, with the papers. It doesn't appear with... I find no, it. neither can I. Oh dear, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
but is that there should be an append appendix with it, which is um, which actually, which actually, actually sort of identifies what we presume to be oh, right. the acquisitions or disposals. OK, well, I think in that case, there probably are no acquisitions, loans and disposals to report <laughs> um, for this. I, I think um, there was a report that's done, but it's not been attached. Um, I don't know what happens well, to that, Nikki. I, okay, I, what I recommend we do is that we note um, the, uh, the, the formal part of the report, but welcome the appendices for distribution. And should any members have questions about that, to address them to you directly? Yes, I think that there certainly was no nothing in the way of disposals. I'm afraid no wheelbarrows this time or anything like that. So it was really to report on where we'd got to. I know in terms of the, um, there was we were disposing of some uh, ship models, if you recall. Yes, and I do. so a lot of those have gone to auction, I believe, or in the process of going to auction, they weren't. Um, they, they weren't, funny enough, no, no other museums were particularly interested in them, so they were going to auction. Uh, in terms of acquisitions, I don't, there was nothing major at all. I mean, literally one or two, um, uh, I think that was a postcard from the Royal Bath Hotel, I mean, very, very little, and loans. Um, I think the only thing of note is that we're loaning our lacquerware, lacquer sample set, which is an extraordinary set of lacquer bowls which demonstrate the process, the Japanese um, process of lacquer, and we're lending that to the Rice Museum in uh, Holland um, a, a bit in a few, a few months' time. So this is one of the few um, international loans. So a few international loans and a few national loans um, are starting. So apologies, I was expecting to look at to be able to talk to, talk to the appendix, but it's missing. But there, there was nothing, I don't think there's anything of major um, significance just to report those. Well, the well, latter seems to be quite significant. Yes. Yes. Um, as long as they're not going to use them for their rice tafel. <laughs> so, right. so, I, I, um, yes, it's a, it's a, a very, very significant uh, lacquer um, item. Uh, um, of, you know, obviously, of very significant importance. So that's uh, great that that's been recognised and is going over to, to the Rice Museum. Thank you very much, Sarah. Item eight. Uh, the update and repair and renewal project, which has attracted funding from Arts Council England under their MEND initiative, which um, will be applied to a number of things, but in particular the restoration of the conservatory. So this is obviously fantastic news um, that this we were successful in this uh, application. Um, so the grant uh, is £518,000 from the Arts Council, £30,000 which we have, the, the museum has raised itself in the last few years. Um, the balance will be made hopefully from partly from SIL. I'm just waiting for absolute sign-off, but that's um, hopeful, um, half from SIL and half from prudential borrowing, which the Russell Coates will then have to raise through um, increased charges. Um, the work that uh, has been done, as I explained, I think, when we... Um, met last um, year was um, either prioritised um, by a team of external and internal surveyors um, and it met the requirements of the uh, MEND fund and has to be capitalised on the, the balance sheet which is um, a significant aspect of this. Um, so the things that we have identified are the complete restoration of the 1901 conservatory which um, as you know, it has to be closed every time it rains because the water just pours through it. Um, so it's not only problems um, from the water ingress, um, but also the um, the floor. There's a, there's a huge crack in the floor, which is growing because of the kind of differential um, expansion of a beam um, internally. So all this will be dealt with. Um, we're also improving uh, the drainage. Um, so obviously, quite often, we have to literally rod the uh, entrance way to the museum while the customers are in, <laughs> enjoying their cream teas on the terrace. So hopefully that will be put paid to that, and that's because there are problems with the drainage that goes out through the Royal Bath Hotel. Um, and we're going to uh, do some uh, improvements to the CCTV coverage um, because of potential problems with lead theft. Lead theft. Uh, the major item of work is the replacement of the air handling units. And what we're trying to do is come up with a solution which will move us away from uh, gas and uh, gas, um, it's using heat pumps, and this is obviously 
planned pre-Ukraine, but obviously it becomes even more important that we move to a sort of um, post-carbon kind of um, system. It's a little bit experimental. What we're thinking about trying to do is, we, for the museum, we have to try and um, stabilise RH levels. It's not about the temperature, it's around the humidity levels. We need to have um, stable humidity levels to, um, to, to create the right environment for, for the object. So what we're looking at doing is reducing the um, temperature levels to maintain a better RH, but at significantly less cost in terms of energy use. So this is kind of what we're trying to do. And this is, at the moment, we're still work, working with our um, uh, external engineers and consultants to, uh, to, to, add, to, to, um, you know, to decide exactly on the kind of final, final scheme. The lead designers, uh, Philip Hughes, have been appointed. And now we'll be moving to appoint the, um, the uh, M&E uh, consultants and the main um, and the, um, build, the builders. So sort of the process is moving. And we're still waiting for planning application because the, uh, it has to go through, um, through Secretary of State. So we need planning application to change the air handling units. So it's quite a significant amount of work to be done. Um, and through this, with the, so the design lead has been appointed um, and work has obviously started. Um, work on site will start in September, October. Did I put the plan in? I don't think I did. But anyway, the work will start on site in September, October. They will strip out two of the plant rooms in the autumn. Then we'll do the conservatory through the um, autumn to the spring. We can move that. That, that sort of independent, and then the last last two plant rooms will be done uh, in the spring. So we should not do it in the winter period when we'll need the, need the services, um, but it will, should, should be finished by this time next year. Um, and we should be able to keep the museum open and running all the way through that list. Yes, that's very much. Yeah. So uh, we should be able to, um, so there will, have, will be impacts because of the scaffolding, and it might, we may, may well have to close for one or two days because um, and see the, the museum is an incredibly complex site and even just bringing scaffolding in, we think we'll have to crane the scaffolding in into the centre, but you know, it's just very complex. So at the moment, uh, we're, we're um, obviously working through how that will work, but the plan is that we will largely be open just with maybe one or two, you know, we're always closed on a Monday, so we just might have to schedule a few days around it just when we're doing particularly, uh, you know, we're bringing big plants uh, or scaffolding in that kind of thing. Good. Well, thank you. Are there any questions that people would like to put to Sarah about the um, very significant uh, assistance that's being rendered to the building, um, within which, you know, the security of the collection is maintained because it's not just the building, it's what's within the building that's otherwise threatened. Um, I, I just on the side, with regard to humidity levels and the management of air within the museum. Um, I, I thought it was very commendable that the um, restoration of the painting that you've referred to, the Barbarossa, um, part of which was done in situ. Um, and I thought this was very informative to visitors who are often unaware of the accretion of time, the effect that it has on a, on a painting but also the effect that the atmosphere has on a painting. So, you know, paintings are there, but they are not there uh, in that particular state forever and ever. They require maintenance. Um, and that is a hidden, a very significant cost for all museums and galleries. Thank you very much uh, for that. I, I just Chairman, think, Chairman, can I ask I a question? I do apologise, Sir George. Um, yeah, I just wanted to understand the financial arrangement with the council and paragraphs twenty and four. Um, I wasn't quite. I didn't quite understand what the arrangement is. Is the council lending money to the museum? Sorry, the gallery that then needs to be repaid, how does it work? Sarah. Um, so the arrangement is that um, the council agreed to match fund 408. What was it, how much was it? 426, that's it, I couldn't remember the magic word. 426,000, we've agreed, so that was original arrangement uh, that, that was match funding, but how that was going to be um, 
uh, funded wasn't uh, originally um, agreed, uh, and the proviso was always the, back, the, the backstop was uh, potential borrowing. Um, so I recently went to the um, a board, the, um, and there is what there's a pot of funding called SIL, which is a um, community infrastructure levy, um, and that's allocated to um, significant projects, presumably for uh, public benefit. And they agreed to find 213 half of that from that particular pot. So that leaves 213,000, which is going to be borrowed by from prevent prudential borrowing, and um, in a sense, that has you know the, the cost of that has to be covered from somewhere, and that will then be passed to the Russell Coates um, to fund that. So we have to fund the um, the interest payments on that for the next twenty years. So that will be an additional burden to the budget that we have to find that um, that funding. But it is only, she says, fifteen about fifteen thousand um, pounds. So that will be probably. I have I will bring a paper to the next meeting. Be funded through uh, an increase. Be funded through an increase in uh, income generated from one method or another, one, per, one from one source or another. Oh, um, well, George is going to come back. Is that my so, Chairman? I, I, so, is this a formal loan? Does the does the principal need to be repaid by the museum, or do the or do the internal payment into the it? it I still, sorry, I'm still not yeah. quite clear how it works. Perhaps, Chairman, you could be proxy for me and in, in, in understand it. Actually, I was going to come in, but I, I, <laughs> I've got the same question without the answer, I'm afraid, Sir George. Um, what, what's clear to me is the, the sill part of it, which is almost half of the 426, almost, that's a, that's a kind of a, a gift, for want of a better word. That does not need to be repaid. I think we all know that. It's the, it's the other bit, which is the prudential borrowing. And I think what you're saying, Sarah, is, what's clear is that the interest on that loan hits the P&L of the Russell Coates to the tune of 15k a year, I think what you're saying. And the question which I'm afraid I don't know equally is, does the lump sum, does the loan, the capital um, value of the loan, um, does that have to be sort of paid off in a kind of a repayment way as well? Is that within the 15 or is there actually, okay, that's what it sounds like, is that so the 15k is part interest and part capital repayment. Yeah, so it I will assume, effectively pay off the loan. Yes, I think it's principal and invest in ah. interest. So that yes, it would both, it would be. Ah. Because that exactly. would generate 20 times uh, 15, which is um, 300,000, is that correct? So the, the cost over and above is what well, you can work it up for yourselves. And so if the interest rate goes up, Stuart, sorry, Sarah Stewart, if, if interest rates are 10% next year from one or whatever they are now, is, is, is the interest rate fixed for 20 years or does it go up? I think it's fixed at 3%, that's my understanding, but maybe Mike, yes, and Mike is nodding. I'm pretty sure that is. It says it's worth fixed at that. So we know it's, stand, it's, it's set for the next 20, 20 years. Michael? Are you able to give authority to this <laughs> proposition? Uh, as much authority as I can, Chair, um, <clears throat> that it is a fixed rate indeed, um, and, and that it would be far too risky if, we're, if it wasn't. So, uh, yes, absolutely. And, Chair, is this a normal arrangement in, in you know, for our peers? Um, because this, is this the first time that the Russell Coates has entered into this kind of arrangement? I have no idea whether it's normal or whether this is, you know, out there. Could I come back in, Chair? Please do. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it is it is a common arrangement, and um, the council ha has been able to borrow at um, v very low rates uh, th uh, through this system for quite a long while. Um, and uh, at the moment, Pool Museum, just as an example, uh, has a much larger commitment through prudential borrowing. Uh, for its capital project, so um, it, it is um, being exercised by the peers, as you say. So I, I, it, I, I am speculating, but I think it is a government fund uh, through which local authorities may access at preferential rates for precisely the sorts of projects which Michael has identified both in pool and elsewhere. Um, so there is 
a degree of custom and practice. Yes. Sorry, just a final one. Does our prospective change in status have any consequence for the borrowing arrangement? I suspect not, but uh, that will be um, subject to confirmation. Chair, could I suggest that we confirm that and come back? Yes. To to the board, uh, to the management committee with with that information. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Councillor Dunlop. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I guess, yeah, it remains to be seen who the debt eventually belongs to. Um, OK, just I just wanted to um, mention the seal, actually, because um, uh, for me, this is really good news to see something like this going through seal. I have long lamented that our Section 106 and our seal money, we don't have a mechanism by which there's a cultural allocation. Uh, many local authorities actually allocate a percentage of uh, things like 106 and SEAL to culture. And in fact, when I first joined Bournemouth Borough Council in 2007, all the Section 106 money went to leisure, uh, which was leisure and tourism. So that enabled us to in, in, invest in a huge amount of, of cultural outdoor activity. Um, and I am an advocate at the moment for this. And I'm, I fed this into the consultancy for the local plan that we need to seriously look at allocating a percentage of these developers' contribution and sill and or sill to culture because um, it is it is it is always a challenge, isn't it, to deal with situations like this where you're dealing with important buildings that have historical significance. So um, it was just to say that it's really good news to see that. That. Um, the other thing on my uh, mind, um, and I'm not sure if you can give me a full answer, and it's, it, it's probably because I'm reasonably new to the table, I identified that there were um, five million, four million uh, pounds worth of vital work over five years. Well, we're kind of almost halfway through those five years. Um, we've looked like we've secured about a million. It was just really to get a, a little bit of a clarity on uh, what we could potentially or what we think we might be doing about the rest, if that's not too <laughs> difficult pile, really. We, you know, we've still got uh, three millions worth of essential repairs. Um, what are we doing about those potentially? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, well, um, you, you're quite correct. The... Um, the estimated uh, uh, maintenance requirements do, um, you know, come to that figure, and those have been professionally sourced. What we're all aware of is that the Russell Coates, and I, it's not alone in this, um, it, it does require very substantial investment and. It is one of the drivers of the matter which we have been debating over the last year about the status of the museum and its capacity to attract the level of funding that is needed. And I think, you know, the, when we can resolve that matter, then we will have a clearer perspective on how we can manage the essential works that are required. But I think it is of some relief, certainly, um, to Sarah and the many people who visit the Russell Coates, that some progress is being made. And what is very, very difficult, I think, for public is that a million pounds has been sunk, but a lot of it will be invisible. Um, they will be aware of the renovations to the conservatory but actually the biggest costs are going in mechanical and electrical updates which are out of sight but are absolutely critical to the ongoing health of the building and the collection. It, Councillor Ian Garth. 
Thank you. If I, if I had two questions and Councillor Donald beat, beat me to the first one, it was about, um, you know, in context, this is one million for what's tagged as urgent repairs and then think actually what's after that. So we've got, is it four or five million, four million? And um, I have a similar question because this is not just um, um, an issue here for the Russell Coates, there's several buildings in general right across the whole route, the, the whole arena of council services. And my particular the one is about all our leisure centres where um, I'm asking for arms around what is the whole sort of maintenance and upkeep and particularly all the unseen stuff that you're talking about, Chair, all of that and but for us not to be doing it on a sort of a, an expedite basis. And these are the other areas I'm talking about. Um, but just for this one, it, it's it, it's worth keeping this alive. So the great news on this one, great news on this one million here, um, but have, have as a, you know, maybe for consideration, Chair, a standing item, which is the, what's the forward view yes. of the maintenance, if it's not the programme, programme implies that it's funded, but what is the maintenance need going forward, which then, of course, raises the question, how on earth are we going to fund it? But very important to keep that discussion alive and with that good sort of forward view about it all. Um, the, the other bit was just the energy, sort of similar but related. You know, um, Han, Sarah, you mentioned, for instance, whether it be heat pumps or whatever the right solution is, this is... Um, good long-term and progressive thinking yes. about, not just because of sad events currently, but also just in general going forward from whether it be a cost or whether it be environmental angle, other angles as well. This is a very, very good area to get into. But again, doing it manageably, yeah, and not in an urgent way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, j just taking up um, Councilling Gull's last point, have we ever investigated solar panels within the balustrade? Clearly, they would not be acceptable in sight. But actually, the you know the it's the ability to find sun in that location is much greater than many buildings enjoy. I think a few years ago, the the, the um, engineers that have done the report that we're using for this did do a report on. Um, sort of environmental kind of improvements and then they, not, nothing was really done. So they looked at these different kind of options that we could have. So I think that's certainly, I think um, I think that um, this has obviously risen up the agenda and, and we're going to look at NPO, um, part of that will be reporting on environmental responsibility and impacts and it's finding a bit of, um, uh, to get a plan. So I think we need a, we need a base and we, we're very, uh, Far behind, I think, in terms of having a baseline, looking at the options, and then trying to have a sort of uh, a kind of plan together of find sourcing in, sourcing um, bits of funding that we could do to um, invest in the building to try and reduce these kind of costs. There, there should be some, but obviously the problem is it's grade two star listed. It's very exposed. It, it's it's and we're trying. We've got to maintain a certain level of yes, kind of, of thing. So it is, it is challenging. But yeah, I think certain work has been done. I don't think it's ever been taken. Uh, it was done some years ago, and I don't think it's been taken quite far enough in terms of actual um, practicalities of implementation. But um, I think this is this is you know, an area of of a major concern. And obviously, our I think the bill, the way I think our, our electricity bills and gas bills this year are significantly higher than they were the previous year. And that will only going to get worse. So actually, you know, the kind of um, the funding by arguments changed as well, isn't it? So now it becomes really worthwhile to invest in this rather than where before actually that's a bit marginal. So I think we're, we're what is space really, I think it's an, it's an area that we definitely, definitely got to, um, to address along with the others. Councillor Dunlop. Did, I'm sorry, did you have a question? No. In which case, um, let me move you to the ninth item, which is the work programme, which is an appendix, uh, agenda item nine. Um, your work is cut out. Sarah, um, uh, there are various things which really, um, you know, uh, are customary really in terms of the reporting that will take place to this committee in due course. To note. Nikki. Thank you, Chair. And yeah, the work programme is something uh, we initially discussed at the informal agenda planning. Uh, and this is something that Democratic Services is going to maintain as a, an ongoing and live document 
but also an item on the agenda that allows a little bit more planning, um, I think, with sort of challenges and work facing the committee uh, and certainly the team at the music, Art Gallery Museum, it's going to be essential that these things are, are planned well ahead and how items are either just going to be dealt with, such as ones you've already seen today, and also those that are going to feed into future cabinet meetings. So the idea of having this item is so it's to allow you to start considering now dates for future meetings, um, dates of where we need to hit cabinet agendas as well, uh, and also any sort of extra items, such as you said, having a standard item on maintenance needs, those can be added to it. This can change every meeting. It can change in between meetings and it can also help you plan if you need to hold informal meetings at all when you do that. Um, you, you know, we, we're going to see a few changes, I think, in membership as well. So that will really help, I think, with new people, including Mr Frost, who's only sort of been to one meeting so far. So open to any ideas, but this was what I've come up with so far. So if there's any questions or feedback on it, anything you'd like me to add, please let me know. Thank you very much. And we note that invitation. Councillor Nienga. <coughs> OK, thank you. Um, you know, obviously, I'm glad something like this exists, but I think just um, you know, in fairness, at the moment, what we're looking at is, is not a, a work programme. It's full of what we've got today, for instance, on the 4th of May, and then two other lines, committee work programme, then the annual account sign off. OK, so so we're, you know, we're, we're out of the gate. We've got something here started. Uh, I think inclusions in this will definitely be, we've been talking about, you know, something regular. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering here whether this sort of purports to be a kind of a, um, a programme plan where actually certain things that we're actually doing, the milestones for those are on here. It may or may not be that. I'm not, I'm not gunning for that kind of approach. Or whether it's something which is... Um, um, uh, it, it's, it's saying when we're going to discuss something. Um, and it could be either. It could be both of those things, by the way. But I think there's something looking forward where, for instance, we could put in there um, the key dates, for instance, for the chairs, the confirmation of the renewal there. That ought to go in here. And I'd suggest, OK, we can put September as the end date. It must happen. And then the earlier date, which is the likely date. So we keep that in sight. There's probably something else to do with the, um, the £1 million programme that's in there whether there's any final sort of confirmation, anything else needed on that, that needs to be in there. Um, there's probably something about, if I may, the Acquisitions Loans Disposals Report. I think we, we've we taken as read, I think, Sarah's verbal update on all of this, but maybe there's something that comes back to next meeting. So again, it's not a project milestone, but it's a, a discussion. Do you, um, I'm being rather vague here because I think there's a nice mix of dates when we must come back and discuss something to just check it's okay. So it's not really in a project mode, but there's other items which are project related things where we must table a discussion at a certain point because it's key to a real world event somewhere else, a deadline with the lawyers or a deadline with something else or with the council or something when we must discuss something um, and agree something by certain dates. So this, this, um, this needs to be filled out rather more, but, um, I'm not being sloping shoulders, I'll help, we'll help get this together. But I think we've got a pretty full agenda over the next 12 to 24 months, and this, this will start reflecting it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good advice. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. If I could just come back on that. Councillor Langer, thank you very much. This, this certainly is you know, a starter for 10, um, and it's to also sort of initiate that working back which we have to do in the cabinet system of if you need something to have gone through cabinet by such and such date what other committees meetings whatever it needs to be do you need to hit so it's to help with that sort of planning as well so far we've been a little bit reactory with dates of this committee um there's a lot of business we need to do it need to hold a meeting it's i'd hope we could actually start to plan these in and get them in calendars earlier and so that we have the standard ones. And if for any reason we do need an extra meeting, you know, that could be looked at in plenty of time um, and, and planned. Um, and also it's it's just to have that little, be able to have that discussion on the agenda because we don't have any other business on this agenda. It also sort of opens up the, if somebody said, I've got a particular item I really think we need to discuss, 
that it can open that up and plan how you do that as well. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. With uh, your collective permission, um, I move you to item 10, which is uh, the exclusion of press and public. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Just, just uh, on, um, on this item, we talked the forward plan. Just, uh, I wonder if, um, Rob, Ron, just leave it there. I, I'm, I'm more than happy to contribute, but equally, I don't want to sort of, you know, sort of speak inappropriately. Just the, um, can, can, can an action somehow be taken from this for whoever's most appropriate, a small number of us, to get together and come up with the next version of this and please if almost do it as soon as as soon as possible yes. get a next draft of this and then it, you know it won't be correct it won't be full but let's fill it out with everything that's known right now have it there and then circulate it maybe within a few weeks a month's time or something like that and then let's take it forward from there i'm more than happy to arrange that if do it as a team sort of catch up if everyone's happy with that okay. michael uh, sorry, Chair, I was coming back on another item, so I apologise for interrupting. OK, I think we're resolved that that's what we're doing. I'll be very pleased to participate in that. That's fine. Ch Chair, if you'd like to decide who, you know, uh, offline, who probably which group should get yes. together and do that. Thank Let's you. Let's do that. Sure. Um, Michael, your point. My, my apologies, Chair. Um, uh, one of the benefits for these meetings is that you can do a bit of quick research uh, um, while the meeting's taking place. And I'd just like to come back, if I may, very briefly on those two points about the interest, the prudential borrowing and the ground and the uh, arrangements for the debt after externalisation. Um, firstly, on the interest rate, uh, I've had it confirmed that it is a fixed term interest rate for the duration of the loan. Um, the actual specific rate does vary according to the uh, amount of risk associated with the project, which I wouldn't have thought in this case uh, is, is, uh, is substantial. Um, so the, the rate which Sarah has been quoted, I, I would fully expect to be uh, the one that's fixed when the, um, when the loan actually takes place, which I imagine is very soon. Um, and the second item, the other item um, we were asked about the um the arrangements um if if the Art gallery museum is externalized and um i've been advised that this would be part of the grant arrangement so what i would expect to happen is that the uh, debt itself would remain with the council because this is it is after all the council which is borrowing the money not the russell coates art gallery and museum and then the repayment would be simply part of the grant arrangement between uh, the Council and the Art Gallery and Museum. Thank you very much for that clarification, Michael. Thank you. Um, item 10, exclusion of press and public. Um, I know members are aware, but it's important that um, uh, any members of public now watching that under section 100A subsection 4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the public be excluded from the meeting for the following items of business on the grounds that they, they involve the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 in part 1 of the Schedule 12A of the Act and that public interest in withholding the information outweighs such an interest in disclosing it. Um, for which reason I'm turning to you, Claire, um, to invite you to turn off the public access to the meeting.